in September of 2022. We headed down the center of the country. We went around the tip of Florida, visited Cuba, and now we're headed up towards um, Portland, Maine, and then we'll go all around the Great Lakes and come back out uh, of them in Chicago. So that's what we're doing. Um, we stop and talk about nuclear issues wherever we go. On our discussion of nuclear weapons, we have a very special guest today, Dr. Vincent Antoni, and he has written two books about nuclear weapons, and I would like for him to get us going on what you know and what we should talk about next. Vinny, are you ready? Cool. Um, so, for those of you that don't know me before we get into the discussion, my name is Vincent Atandi. I'm a professor of history at Montgomery College in Tacoma Park, Maryland. Um, I used to also be the director of research for American University's Nuclear Studies Institute, where I got my doctorate back in 2009. And my research focuses on the intersection of race and nuclear weapons. Um, I mentioned that because not only we'll be talking about um, my work with books, but I noticed out there, the first thing I saw was Byron Rustin. Um, and Byron Rustin was such a long seasoned activist in terms of nuclear disarmament. And in fact, uh, while Golden Rule was happening, Rustin was actually in London giving a monumental speech on nuclear disarmament. And it was Rustin who actually put a team together of activists to go to Africa when um, France announced they were going to test their first nuclear weapon in the Sahara. And at the same time, you had Algeria's fight for independence, and you had Ghana gaining their independence, and Nkrumah rising to power, and the people in Ghana really feared what the fallout would do to the cocoa industry. And so it was Rustin that put a team of activists together and literally put his body on the line to try to stop um, the French nuclear test from happening and said it was the most important work that he had ever done. So um, he's just been a lifelong activist in this, so it's great that you have him up there. We don't ever forget. We also just lost somebody recently who was a lifelong activist in terms of nuclear disarmament also, and that was the great Harry Belafonte. Uh, Harry Belafonte was part of, um, yes, uh, he was part of... Hollywood for Sane, he was part of um, performing artists for nuclear disarmament, so this was something that was always on his radar. And then lastly, before we get started, um, today of course is um, you, the International Day for, for Workers. Um, I have proud to be in a union my entire life. My father was in a union, my grandfather was in a union, um, and when we look back, unions uh, have been so important in the fight for nuclear disarmament. In fact, every May Day for so long, Paul Robeson would go with them on their floats, on their parades, and actually talk about nuclear disarmament throughout all of the May Day parades. So it is important also to show you how all of these things, whether it's race, whether it's economy, whether it's workers' rights, how these things all intersect and actually relate to nuclear disarmament. These are not siloed issues. So I'm going to think for a little while about my new book um, and then open it up for a discussion and answer any questions you may have about any of my work or any you know contemporary issues that you want. I'd much rather have a discussion with you guys than, than just listen to me. So um, a couple, I'll start with a couple quotes. Um, I will not only kill them, I will also kill all of their family members. Um, let there be an arms race. We will outspend China and Russia into oblivion to win a new arms race. These are just some of the words of former President Donald Trump. Uh, Trump talked about restarting nuclear testing. He talked about using nuclear weapons in North Korea and having Saudi Arabia, South Korea, and other countries have their own nuclear weapons programs. And of course, uh, was planning to spend trillions of dollars on new nuclear weapons when we already have enough to end civilization multiple times over. And so it was during Trump's presidency that I started to notice a heightened awareness about nuclear weapons that I hadn't seen since the 1980s when I was young and growing up. Um, people started for the first time realizing that our policy here is literally that the President of the United States has sole authority to end life on this planet and there are no checks and balances. Um, people thought that, oh, they would say in, in, in mainstream media, well, if, if Trump ever decided to do this, some military person would tackle him at the last second. No, that's not how it works. And then you add in Russia's criminal, uh, monstrous invasion of Ukraine and Putin threatening to use nuclear weapons. And again, we had a, a, a heightened awareness of all things nuclear. And so it made me start to ask the question, can we organize around fear? And the answer I came up with with this research was yes, but we also have to provide the hope. 
And that's why I started writing this book. So looking at the June 12th, 1982 rally and the nuclear disarmament movement of the 1980s, um, what I wanted to show was that number one, as I do in a lot of my work, that if you look at the largest citizen-led mobilization in our country in the 1980s with nuclear disarmament and the Freeze Initiative, if you look at the June 12th rally, in which a million people were there, you will realize that it was much more diverse than ever, ever previously talked about. That it was led, in many cases, by the Black community and the LGBTQ community. And so representation matters. This movement has always been diverse, since 1945, but these voices are simply ignored. Ralph Allison says, an invisible man, third line of the book, I'm invisible, you see, because you choose not to see me. And so if you are a young African-American person and you are trying to find yourself in this history and you look in the books and you don't see somebody that looks like you or shares a common ancestry with you, then why would you come to this movement, right? And so it's important that we show just how diverse this movement has always been. The second is I wanted to show that a lot of the same issues young organizers deal with today in social movements, racism, homophobia, patriarchy, these issues always existed and show how did these organizers navigate these issues in the 1980s to pull off the biggest rally in our nation's history? How did they get a million people in the streets without Facebook, without email, without cell phones, and somehow they did it, right? Um, and lastly, I wanted to show that grassroots organizing actually can move the needle and change policy, which they did. And so when the United Nations announced they were going to have a second special session on nuclear disarmament, a group of, of organizers, Mike Meyerson and David Courtright and David McReynolds, and later Coral Weiss and others, all of whom I interviewed for this book, uh, agreed that something special needed to be done, something big needed to be done. But they also realized if they were gonna do something big for the second special session on nuclear disarmament, that it was going to have to transcend race it was gonna to have to reach middle America. It was gonna to have to transcend religion and political parties and ideology. And who or what could bring all of these constituencies together? In one word, Reagan. Um, now, Reagan's election was essentially a perfect storm. The right had tried to undo the New Deal since FDR. And going into the 60s, they tried to win with Barry Goldwater, and of course, that was a disaster against Johnson in 64. They try again with Richard Nixon, that's a disaster as well, and they know they got one more shot here. And so it's this perfect storm because coming out of the Vietnam War, as so many of you know, um, people were fatigued. They were suffering their own PTSD. Veterans came back with no limbs and brain injuries, exhausted and, 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 and suffering from PTSD. You had activists who had been in the street making sure we, to stop this genocide in Vietnam. And so a lot of anti-nuclear groups shifted their focus to the Vietnam War. People are exhausted from just death, right? You had Martin being killed in 68 and Bobby Kennedy and JFK and Malcolm X and little Bobby Hutton and Medgar Evers and so many others. Um, they had had to flee under, underground and lost their families to avoid prosecution for crimes they didn't commit or flee the country. And this is when we see people really start to separate themselves. Some saying, you know what, I'm going to go live on a commune and I'm going to make my own food and my own clothes and, and drop acid and just divorce myself from all of this madness. I can't handle it anymore. Others, you know, start to self-medicate and going to disco clubs and start getting into all sorts of drugs in that way. And so the right during this time knew they had one shot. And what they start doing is they make the decision to merge with the moral majority. They make, now they start focusing on cultural issues like guns and abortion and, and, and gay marriage and things of this nature. And Jimmy Carter, President Carter, um, some things weren't his fault, some were, but the economy and the energy crisis, um, Ted Kennedy primary and him certainly didn't help. But then of course you had the Iranian revolution. And what we now know with the hostage situation in Iran was that um, President Reagan actually cheated and committed treason in which he actually sent a team to Iran to ensure that they kept the hostages um, there until he was president and could then come out and free them. And so when Reagan comes into office, uh, Reagan really scares the hell out of the American public. And they really start to believe that there is going to be a nuclear exchange between us and Russia. He uh, was against every arms control agreement we ever had. He says, uh, he lies and says that the US uni uh, unilaterally disarmed in the 1970s. 
He now says he wants to start the MX missile program, the B-1 bomber program. Um, and if you look at his cabinet, he surrounds himself with cabinet officials that all agree with him. So George H.W. Bush, Casper Weinberger at Defense, William Casey at CIA, Gene Kirkpatrick at the UN, Secretary of State Alexander Haig. These are all individuals that came out publicly and said that we can win a nuclear war and that this should be on the table and we should do this. All of his officials, or most of them that had to get confirmation hearings, were saying things in the confirmation hearings like, oh, only 10 million people will die in a nuclear war. That's not all Americans. Let's give every American a shovel, and if they dig a hole big enough and put a door on top of it, they'll be okay. This was literally the rhetoric coming out in the 1980s. And then he actually goes to work doing what he said he was going to do, which was largely on how he spent his money. He spent over $2 trillion in his term, two terms as president, on the military, mostly on nuclear weapons. And by spending this kind of money, um, who lost the poor? In his first term, 24% of children under six were now living in poverty. 12 million people were declared officially poor and impoverished. Over 1 million children in his first term now had the, their, their free lunch, the only meal of the day that they got, cut. Uh, in parts of Detroit in his first term, over one third of children un, were dying before the age of one years old from malnutrition. So this is what we were seeing as a result of the Reagan administration while he massively expanded our nuclear arsenal. In addition to that, in the 1980s, you had an entire nuclear culture that was developing. Between 1979 and 1983, 130 books were published dealing with nuclear disarmament and nuclear war. The two most famous were Jonathan Shell's Fate of the Earth, which no student today has, has read at all, which is tragic. And the second was The Unforgettable Fire, which was more like a coffee table book of pictures drawn by atomic bomb survivors, the Habaksha. And there was this other thing that came out in the early 80s called MTV. And for anybody young in here, back in the day, MTV actually played music videos. And if you watched MTV, you couldn't get away from nuclear war. There were groups like Genesis, who had a video in which a puppet of Ronald Reagan wakes up with, with Alzheimer's and amnesia and hits the wrong button and ends up blowing up the world. There were people like Sting, who had songs called The Russians, Men at Work. There were all sorts of, of singers that actually had nuclear disarmament somewhere in their lyrics or in their videos. You also had Three Mile Island happening, which really started to freak people out about nuclear <coughs> power and nuclear energy and how this plays in. So all of this was happening around um, the second session on nuclear disarmament. And so this also, what Reagan did, is it awoke a sleeping giant. And groups like SANE and Union for Concerned Scientists and Physicians for Social Responsibility all saw memberships grow in the early 80s now. But there were new groups. Groups like performing artists for nuclear disarmament, groups like dancers for nuclear disarmament, nurses for nuclear disarmament, architects for nuclear disarmament, um, Blacks Against Nukes, Athletes United for Peace. We saw it in all different areas of the country and in all different professions coming together, saying this isn't a right-left issue, but we need to stop this from happening. And so of the, of the folks in the 80s that were really galvanizing the public, if I had to pick two, it would easily be Helen Caldicott and Randy Forsberg. Um, Helen Caldicott, who I interviewed for this book, the Australian uh, doctor, and, and what she, when she was seeing all this, as a mother, as a doctor, she thought she had a, a, a unique perspective that she could bring to the table. And what she did that was so important, she went and got a Hollywood agent. And that agent got her on every single talk show, every news show, in Ladies Home Journal, in People Magazine, anywhere. And everywhere she went, she focused on one thing, the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons. What happens to your eyes? What happens to your skin? What does radiation do to you, right? So people started thinking, my God, I don't want this to happen to my children. And Randy Forsberg, who was working in this field and, and, and started reading all the data and realized that something had to be done. And of course, she creates the Nuclear Freeze Initiative. And the genius behind the Nuclear Freeze Initiative is number one, it provided agency. And I cannot stress this enough. You have to be able to give something to people so they feel they're doing something um, tangible. You could take the freeze initiative to your common council, to your mayor, to your governor. You could get it on a ballot initiative in which they did. And we'll talk about the TPNW and how that's so similar. 
But the other thing is, what she realized is, it was important that you didn't need a degree in physics to understand this issue. And so the freeze initiative just simply said we wanted to freeze the testing, deployment, and, and, and production of nuclear weapons, period. And so you didn't need to be in this wonky think tank to understand it. Um, Malcolm X always used to talk about, he would say, you need to make it plain. And what Malcolm meant by that is, you know, Malcolm was so brilliant, he could go debate the best minds in the world at Oxford in England, which he did in 1964. But he could also reach the boy on the block, the hustler, the drug dealer, um, and he would say, I don't need the fancy language, make it plain for them. And so it's a rarity to have that crossover ability. The only other person I've seen that could do that was Tupac Shakur. Um, and so she understood that and it resonated. And so as all of this was coming together, now the hard part came, the planning of this. And if I was, you know, most of the folks I interviewed for the books would tell me, who cares who came up with the idea? It was a collective, that's an ego thing, right? Um, but if there was one person who was the organizer of this rally and put this all together, it was Leslie Kagan. Um, Leslie Kagan is still around in New York. I interviewed her multiple times for this. She is just a hero and a treasure that we have. Um, and so Leslie Kagan was also um, gay and out at that time. And this was 1982. This is not where we are today. So it was not easy for her and what she dealt with inside this movement in terms of homophobia. Uh, and then there was um, Riverside Church. Cora Weiss was also a big working William Sloan Coffin Jr. at Riverside and organizing folks. And then, of course, Kathy Engel was another one who I interviewed for this book. And Kathy is a professor at NYU today, teaches English, an award-winning poet. She's a brilliant and amazing. And, and she was a young activist organizer who they tasked her with getting all of the celebrities, all of the Broadway folks. That's what she worked on, uh, which was so incredibly important. And lastly, the Habak show, bringing the atomic bomb survivors here. They were also incredibly important. But now the issue became, should this be intersectional? Right? When you bring in so many constituencies and so many groups, that's when all the, all the personalities collide. And so it was difficult because those in the black community, Reverend uh, Herbert Daughtry and the Black United Front, the Third World People's Coalition, they were saying, we have to tie this to race. Look where money is being spent and how it's hurting our communities. Um, look where nuclear testing and, nu and use and production, this has always affected people of color. So this has to be in this. Others said absolutely not. Um, some were saying that um, in addition to this, we need to make sure that we talk about Israel invading Lebanon at the time. And then others said no. Or focus on, on the issue of Reagan employing death squads in El Salvador at the time. And so all of these issues were kind of now coming front and center when you're trying to organize this many people together. And at one point, it really gets so bad that it looks like it's not going to happen. It was going to be a split because, and most people I interviewed all use the same term. They called it the corporate coup. And it was led by Cora Weiss. And Cora and a few others wanted to kick out Reverend Daughtry, the Black United Front, and some of the more left-leaning groups. And so they started splitting off and thinking they were gonna do their own thing. And it got pretty nasty, um, sadly. Um, and, and also they're trying to decide like, who do you have talk? Because when you, you don't want to have an alphabet soup of issues, you want to focus on the one issue of nuclear disarmament, but you also want to include all these folks. And so this all you know, became an issue until they finally settled it. And when they settled it, they agreed that 50% of the leadership that day would be African-American. And they agreed there was one point where they had all these separate task force, a task force for labor, a task force for teachers and so on. And there was no separate task force for the LGBTQ community. And so when some raised their voice about this, some of the other organizers said, we don't want to do that because it might turn off some more religious conservative groups like the Catholic Church. What they didn't know, there were two Catholic nuns in the meeting and they immediately spoke up and said, don't put this on us. We don't care anything about that issue. That's not what we're here for. And so we ended up getting an LGBTQ task force and two prominent members from that community spoke that day. Um, and so, when the day comes, I really can't press upon you how important the arts community was in this. Uh, people like the Bread for Puppets, uh, Bread and Theater Puppets group that organized and had giant paper machines and all sorts of theater and street demonstrations. Kathy Engel had 
established poets on every corner from the UN to Central Park that people could hear talking about nuclear disarmament. Uh, even the official poster that's in the book, if you remember, it was a dove with five legs coming out of it. And the five legs were all different, different races, different shoes, different pants, a skirt, whatever. And when I interviewed the, the artist of it, he said because he always looked at this movement as being intersectional and he wanted to show how diverse this movement was. I mean, people like where they got the money, uh, people like James Taylor and Bruce Springsteen and so many other singers were having free concerts and those concerts were that all the money for those concerts they raised essentially was being given to this. Um, you had in, in uh, the Rockettes in, in New York City Ballet and the Nutcracker, they were putting in the playbills actual ads for nuclear disarmament and to go to the June 12th rally. And so you had people like Roy Scheider and, and Ozzie Davis and Ruby Dee and Coretta Scott King and um, I mean I could go on and on of how many people, how many celebrities were involved in this. And the day comes, June 12th, it's a gorgeous day and Leslie and others go down there at like 7 in the morning and they see thousands of people already there. They had spent the night in Central Park. They realize every train in the entire New England area has added cars and is sold out. Buses sold out all over this country. People coming in from Canada, people coming from Japan, people coming from all over the place um, for this rally. And they realize just how big now it was going to be. And it was a very kind of festive, hopeful atmosphere. Yoko Ono shows up backstage and there's kind of a hush. Uh, she doesn't want to come out and speak to anybody. But Orson Welles goes out there and delivers just an amazing speech. And you had singers like Shaka Khan and Linda Ronstadt and so many others that were actually speaking or uh, singing that day. But of, the, of the, the, the two kind of the speeches that everybody clung to, one was Helen Caldecott. And Helen Caldecott goes up there and she always kind of just rich, she never had anything prepared. And the line that kind of made all the news was she said, there's no communist babies, there's no capitalist baby, a baby is just a baby. And then Randy Forsberg went up there and you know, it said, we did it, we have a million people here, um, that was the official police numbers, and, but it's important now that we go home and organize, right? And so that's really important, again, that agency that the Freeze Initiative gave to people to go home and do something. You know, the agency is important, but also when you bring that many people together, that's also important. Because when you have younger folks, especially that are, you know, in places like South Dakota or Iowa or wherever, and they may feel alone, that they're the only person in their community that cares about this issue. And then you meet and you see that there's a million other people that are doing this work too. It matters. You feel that you're not alone. You're part of something bigger. So just bringing people together, you know, matters. Um, and the police were even smiling. They were even carrying doves and saying, this matters to us too. We don't want to die from nuclear war. And the next day, uh, all the media said there wasn't a single piece of garbage to pick up. Nothing. Everything was cleaned up after that. And two days later, we forget that on June, June 14th, there was a massive civil disobedience uh, demonstration where over a thousand people were arrested. This was worked out with the police to, again, have dine-ins and sit-ins to, again, raise attention on this entire issue. So, the last part of the title of the book is June 12th, Detroit Rally and Beyond. And I have that in there because as a historian, I don't understand why anybody studies history if you're not gonna bring it up and see how it's relevant today. That makes zero sense to me. So we wanna look at the legacy and, and what we can take away from this. So when it first happened, um, a lot of people said it was a failure. There was no consensus agreement that came out of the second special session at the UN. Um, the Reagan administration said they were all at Camp David, they weren't paying attention to any of this going on. Um, you, the, arms con the arms race continued. And then when you look at Trump's actions and Putin's actions, we look at now that China is massively expanding their nuclear arsenal. We see Putin willing to now put uh, nuclear weapons in Belarus. You see President Biden recently saying they're gonna send nuclear capable subs to South Korea. And it's really easy for us to go, yeah, maybe, maybe we failed. Um, but the reality is a little bit different because Years later, I went back and looked, and all of the Reagan officials, Secretary of State George Shultz, his pollsters, Nancy Reagan, and others, all said, yeah, we knew exactly what was going on. You put a million people in the streets, you can't ignore that. We knew we were gonna have to change policy. And so Reagan then meets with Gorbachev, 
And if we're looking for the person that ended the Cold War, the visionary for, for a future, it was Gorbachev, not Reagan. And Gorbachev meets with Reagan and he says to him, let's do it. Let's get rid of all nuclear weapons right here, right now. All I'm asking is that this ridiculous Star Wars plan that Reagan had, you just keep it into the laboratory for 10 years. Don't weaponize space and we can do it right now. And Reagan says no at the golden hour and walks. Um, but we did get the INF Treaty in 1987 as a result of this. And that was significant. It eliminated the entire set of nuclear weapons, especially in Europe. Now, of course, Trump let that expire as well. But, you know, in 1986, there were 70,300 nuclear weapons in the world. Today, that number is 13,100. The U.S. had in its arsenal at one point 25,000 nuclear weapons. Today, that number is 5,500. Is that not success? Is the fact that we're all alive here in this room not success? And so you have to look at this movement like the Black Freedom Movement and other social movements. It's a long movement. And it started in 1945 with the church and with atomic scientists and with the Habaksha, and it continues today. And if we want to see any real proof of the success of the June 12th rally and the organizing in the 80s, then you need to look no further than the TPNW, right? How many, if you would have said to people in the 1980s that we were going to get a, an actual binding treaty in the United Nations banning all nuclear weapons, they would have said, you're crazy, right? Maybe they were that hopeful, but it happened. And so to see what ICANN did, to see what this treaty has done, is it the be all end all? No, it's a tool. At one point, landmines were used in war. They are not anymore because of a landmine treaty. You chip away at it, just like chemical weapons. And if we look at the NPT, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty of 68, if we look at that as the cornerstone to building any house, then the capstone is the TPNW. We got a lot of floors to build in between, but that's where we're aiming at. And, and if we wanna look at the juxtaposition of race in this fight, when you look at the TPNW, when you look at 120 nations, mostly from the global south, from countries in Africa and Latin America and Southeast Asia saying, we reject this and we are signing and ratifying this treaty. And on the other side, at that point, you had Trump and Putin, two white nationalist dictators with 90% of the world's nuclear arsenal. It could not have been any clearer. When you look at the US and Great Britain and France and Russia, when you look at them boycotting and fighting the TPNW, how rich is that? France, Great Britain, and the U.S., all with their own history of slavery, right? All with their own history of colonialism, and Russia with its own history of internal slavery. When it shows you that these countries have an utter contempt of life, and in many cases, black life, right? And what the TPNW is, is, is so, why I look at it in such a positive light, especially, is because, again, you don't need a degree in physics to understand it. And it is something that you can take with you, and you can get your mayors and your governors and your representatives to sign on to the TPNW, right? And you look what New York City just did. New York City, ICANN and the organizers there just got New York City's pension fund to digest $415 million from nuclear weapons making producers. That is significant, it matters. And so, I'm often reminded of, of the great writer Rebecca Solnit's words when she talks that and she says that the activism and the work we do will not be felt for this generation, but that is not a reason to fall into despair. The reality is that when I die, there are going to be nuclear weapons on this planet and there will probably still be institutional racism, but that isn't why I'm doing this. I do this so that future generations, people I don't know, kids I don't know, grandkids, that they can one day live in a world free from fearing they're going to die from nuclear war. Uh, and so it won't happen overnight. This is a long struggle. It is a marathon, but you keep chipping away at it. And so I hope by writing this book, those that come to it and read it will be educated, motivated and inspired to once again raise that anti-nuclear banner. And I will leave you with the words of Audre Lorde that guide me every single day of my life in this work. Survival is indeed the greatest gift of love that we can give one another. Thank you.